we've already achieved getting to a billion users through our collective efforts in our careers on our previous startups. And so this isn't necessarily having to touch a billion people's lives. It could be touching half a billion people's lives and giving an extra two years of health to those half a billion, or it could be a hundred million and giving them 10 years of health on average. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Next Big Thing HQ, where we interview founders and showcase startups raising capital via Rake CF. Today, we have an innovator, a true disruptor on the podcast. We have the CEO and co-founder of Humanity, the number one health and longevity consumer app, Peter Ward. Peter, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here, Connor. Thanks for having me. So first, I want to set the table for the listeners. Humanity is in your first company. You started with Wayne in 2002, and that became the largest travel social network you exited to lastminute.com group in 2016. So this isn't your first rodeo. And being an entrepreneur, you've had to understand people have wants, needs. And as the entrepreneur and founder, you have to solve those wants and needs. So my first question is, why does the world need humanity? It's a quite a grandiose statement in itself, isn't it? We all need humanity and to have a bit of humanity. But I guess the reason for the brand and, and our ethos is really about trying to democratize access to health, data, insights, and really empowering people to understand that it's in our hands and control to be able to look after our own health and to prevent or stave off these nasty diseases and things that accelerate our decline prematurely, often without having to do so because we are unconsciously or unknowingly making the wrong choices for our health and our lifestyle and environment. And really what we're doing is we are taking the breakthrough science and technology that is available and is being leveraged by some of the privileged few. And we're trying to provide that on mass at scale, at a easy to understand, at easy to access and consume and engage way, which is like built upon the kind of careers of experience that we've had to scale mass consumer tech platforms to over a billion users. So you mentioned easy to use and easy to access and humanity is an app that everyone can download. What are, I guess, the metrics that you're showing so that the everyday person can see kind of where they are and how they can improve their life to live a healthier life for longer? That's a great question, Connor. And the problem with most health apps, health and fitness apps is that they're all abstractions. They all focus on some kind of metric that people, I guess, feel is a good indicator of their health, such as have I hit my 10,000 steps? Have I completed my rings? You know, all of these sort of like nice ways to think, well, I must be doing something good, but none of them are directly coming back to the thing that we all really care about, which is, is it making me healthier? And there's no better measure of whether you're getting healthier or not than your biological age and rate of aging, because essentially that is telling you, how are you doing compared to your actual chronological age, you know, the age that's on your birth certificate versus how old you are trending in terms of your functional age, how able are you to maintain full function for as long as possible compared to people in your cohort and your age group. So if you're three years younger than your chronological age, that means that you are doing better than the person of average at your age by three years. And if you keep that trajectory out, that will probably extend to maybe four, five, six years. And that's obviously you know, a win because it means that you're going to be staving off disease. You're going to be around to see your loved ones, your grandkids, and be able to you know, kick a soccer ball or do things for longer than, than your peers. Now, I want to talk about your mission with humanity. And what I saw is that you want to basically bring back a billion years of life by the end of this decade, which when I think about that, I get chills because the, the impact that has, there's multiple different levels of impact it has. You can look at like the economics, but what I like to look at is more of like the memories that can be made with the loved ones, with the friends and families, those special moments. Now you're adding an increasingly more amount of special moments in someone's life, in multiple people's life, because that one person's, you know, extra healthy life doesn't just affect them, but it affects everyone that's in their circle. So just talk to me about making such a big grand mission. What is the thought process? And then how are you planning on executing that going forward? Yes, there's probably as much effort to come up with a less grandiose mission than there is a big one. You just take slightly different decisions and 
approaches based on how to get to a much more seismic one. And as much as it sounds, you know, really lofty, you know, we've already achieved getting to a billion users through our collective efforts in our careers on our previous startups. And so this isn't necessarily having to touch a billion people's lives. It could be touching half a billion people's lives and giving an extra two years of help to those half a billion, or it could be a hundred million and giving them 10 years of health on average. I mean, the way we see it is it's not just about how we can get as many people as possible to use humanity, to change their, their health behavior, and then see that inflection point change in their health trajectory and outcomes. It's about how do we propagate capabilities like measuring biological age as a solution that can be leveraged, not just by our users, but by hospitals, by health systems, by enterprises, by labs, clinics, insurance companies, and the like. And that way we really can change the world. And to give you an example, I mean, we wanted to make it so much easier for people to understand how they're aging. And one of the most obvious ways to do that is to look at bloods. And at the moment, at least up until we launched this latest model, you would have to spend hundreds of dollars and get very specific blood markers with a very few handful of companies to get your biological age based on your bloods. Whereas millions and millions of blood tests are happening around the world every single month. And no one knows what that means in terms of the biological age. But we created a, a new model that is 9.2% more accurate than the most accurate blood aging model out there to date. And more importantly, we made it work based on just four to six analytes using machine learning and AI. And that essentially has turned the whole system on its head so that anybody who's getting a blood test even if it's just a common standard panel from your local doctors can essentially even take a picture of those bloods, send it into humanity via the app, and we can analyze those data points and give you a biological age feedback loop. And we can also provide that via API or as a license to an organization as well, thus giving everyone access to this amazing technology. That's amazing. Can you walk us through the app so someone can know what it's like using the app and what they can expect? Absolutely. So the way we engage people from the get-go is really to understand, first of all, what they're trying to achieve and then guiding them on the path to what is it that measuring your aging is and how do you affect it. And then, of course, we try to get you into a way of understanding whether you're on the right path or not by having a daily humanity score. That humanity score is essentially a function of your movement, mind, nutrition and recovery actions. And within those categories, you have these sub actions, for example, how many minutes you're spending in high, moderate, low intensity activity, how many minutes you're meditating, what's your fasting windows, sleep time, and so on. And the idea being that once you start to understand how these combinations of actions work together, you can start to see what's having the greatest effect on your daily score. And in so doing, by increasing your daily score, which is personalized to you, you can then increase leverage and probability to affect your rate of aging and biological age in the right direction. And so idea being that you can get your baseline and then you can start improving upon that baseline. And what we've done is we've built in all of these feedback loops, variable rewards, gaming mechanics, social proofs to essentially make it not only easy and rewarding, but also, you know, very sticky and engaging as well. And you mentioned sticky and you have a chart that shows the impact, the behavior change people have before using the app, Humanity app, to after using the Humanity app. So can you talk about what that behavior change is, the improvements you saw with the users? Yeah, so we wanted to have the closest thing we can to a before and after measure that was unbiased. And the beauty of Apple Health is that when we connect to that with the user permissions, we then get to pull in all of your movement data from the past, you know, 180 days and compare it to will be when you continue to use the app. And most people say an app, a habit is formed in 21 days or, or 30 days. And so to sort of make sure that we were not just fad for people, you know, who download the app, we looked at the 40 days prior versus the 40 days after signing up. And what we were so astonished to see, you know, in terms of the impact was that you saw a stark and not only stark, but a sustained increase around 15 and half percent median increase in movement score based on the same par you know, parameters before and after. And in fact, if you look at different subgroups, those who had a BMI over 30, for example, that increased to over 18%. So what that tells us is that 
whilst there might be some confirmation bias by signing up, you may have made that choice to say, I'm going to do something about my health, regardless of whether that was the inflection point or not. Many people download an app and then they kind of realize there's nothing really about this that makes me do anything about this. Yeah. Whereas, you know, we're happy to see that people actually then change and then sustain that change consistently over time. And that's reflected both in our engagement metrics and retention metrics as well. Can you talk a little bit about the business model? Because it seems like, obviously, with an app, you're going to consumers, but you also mentioned you have partnerships, you're developing partnerships. There's kind of a B2B business model. So can you talk more about that? Yeah. So I guess my co-founder, Mike Gear and I have always been experienced in consumer tech platforms first. We want to always get to consumer grade because that means that we create something that is high value to the end consumer so that they are willing to not only use it, but pay for it. And our conversion, you know, metrics of 12% conversion to premium overall really reflect the willingness to, to pay for the service. So we've done a few things. We've done a, a premium offering to keep it affordable. We've also got a free version, which means you still get your rate of aging and a lot of the sort of daily action activity guidance so that it's really available to everyone for free. But we then have these extra value offerings. So the premium gives you your biological age. It also gives you aging trends, gems, and some more gamification capabilities. And that's only 50 uh, pounds or $60 a year. And then we have a new product that we've just launched called Pro, which is in beta, and we're rolling that out slowly, which is $180 a year. And that includes blood aging. So essentially, when you have a blood test, you can just add it to humanity. And no matter how many you add, we then analyze it and we augment the data with your movement and heart rate data to give you an accurate biological age and rate of aging. We also have uh, Enterprise, which is something that we are working closely with our strategic partnership with Apple, who really encouraged us to consider doing an enterprise offering. And it's thanks to the help that we've built a dashboard and we're now looking at how we can bring this to some of their key accounts. And then lastly, we have our APIs and the APIs are something that can work both on iOS and Android and allow us to plug in our biological age API capabilities into other apps that maybe health and wellness brands have or hospitals or clinics, personal trainers, they all have these companion apps. We can then plug that directly into their system and give their customers, patients, or other constituents a way to better understand how they're doing and motivate them to, you know, do more. That's awesome. And you're raising on WeFunder. So raising capital via Reg CF, how are the funds going to get allocated in order to continue to grow, continue to scale, to continue to hit the benchmarks you set out over the next couple of years? Yeah. So uh, I guess the, the first thing is we're developing those product capabilities that I just mentioned, some of which had already started and, and this enables us to continue developing those capabilities and improving upon them based on customer feedback and partnership input. We're also hiring. So we're bringing in a person to lead our B2B sales efforts. We're bringing in a, another, you know, developer or so and people into the team that can help us with the current offering. And of course, we'll be looking to add, you know, more capabilities that can just help us scale the proposition to reach our goals. I want to talk about your number one priority, which is viral growth. And I feel like virality, a lot of people say it, but it's kind of that word that people toss out. And I feel like it's a uh, very muddy word. You clearly achieved virality with Wayne because you scaled it immensely. But can you define virality for me? And then how are you going to achieve viral growth? What's kind of the roadmap for that? Yeah, that's a great question. There's a lot of stuff online you can read about viral growth. And the way to really look at it is that the viral multiplier or the K factor is really looking at over a certain time cycle for every one person that joins, how many new people can be signed up through that one person joining. So for example, you get a thousand people that join, will those 1000 people bring in another, say 1000 people within say 30 days. And that's an equation that you can calculate based on referrals and so forth. This is something that, as you quite rightly mentioned, we perfected in my previous company, Wayne and my co-founder did when he was in the founding team at Badu, we had huge success. I think that with health, it's obviously something you have to be a lot more sensitive with. So we're being very intentional about how we enable people to be go, become multiplayer, if you like, in the app system rather than just single player. And it's certainly not an essential requirement. But what we do see is for those who add at least one person in a circle, the engagement goes up by 40 to 50%. So what we're really doing is trying to add at this point, a little bit more enrichment to the experience for those who are in each other's circles. 
and of course, making it an, as frictionless as possible for people to add their friends and family to the system, but also connect with their friends of friends as well. Because the interesting thing about the way humanity works is it's a little bit like the reverse version of Alcoholics Anonymous in that you, know, you have these accountability buddies. There might be people that you've there you know, from different walks of life who you come together and you support each other in that case to give up alcohol. In this case, it's about supporting each other to be healthier, to live a healthier life for longer. And so we create these very simple mechanics, which allow you to celebrate, ping or wave at each other to, you know, essentially just check in with each other to sort of keep you accountable to yourself. And we'll be adding more capabilities along the lines of that to uh, just positively reinforce good behavior so that people feel more and more motivated and getting a positive dopamine reward for doing something that's good for themselves and encouraging them to help others. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. You want some sort of networking effect, but with health, it is more sensitive. So you don't want the networking effect for anyone to see anyone's health levels, right? You want the person to kind of have privacy over what they want to show, what they don't want to show. And that is kind of a line you have to kind of walk carefully just because, you know, I can see some people clearly aren't going to want to show their health levels at all times, right? No, that's, that's right. part of the process. It's a journey. We're very conscious of that. And that's why we're very much focused on the sort of daily activity and how we can encourage you to get a good score each day. There is a, a lot of interest in people wanting to share their own rate of aging, biological age data, for example, but that would be at the user's consent or opt-in to do so. And I think you'll see that we'll be probably adding more things based on the user demand for that as well, because it, again, it's, it's very motivating for people to feel, you know, that they're, they're making progress and they want to use that to encourage others to do the same. And in the beginning, you kind of talked about the technological breakthroughs that have happened recently that have allowed this new data. And I wanted to tie that I've seen you talk a lot about in recent interviews, synthetic data. So mm -hmm. can you talk about the importance of synthetic data, not only for humanity, but for scientific progress going forward? Yeah. Uh, so I mean, we're in a whole new world, right? Generative AI is creating the new internet in a way. But not just that, it's creating a whole new set of capabilities that enable us to do things that were, were just impossible even months ago, and that change is, is rapid. One of those disruptions, which we have been at the forefront of experimenting with on an R&D level is really looking at how we can leverage existing data sets like ours and then train models to essentially create mimic versions of those combinatorial effects such that it doesn't matter if you, I know the personally identifiable information of the people that created those data sets, but actually it's more looking at the patterns between those different attributes, whether those attributes be biomarkers, you know, phenotypical attributes like age, biological gender, and so on. And then over time, seeing how they get affected by different action events and combinatorial action events. So looking at those interconnections, the neural net, if you like, of that is really what we are looking to you know, recreate using synthetic data. And my co-founder just coined a term actually, which has been to sort of like published on his blog called LBMs or large biological models. So if you look at the, the disruption that we're seeing with language models, where of course, you know, we are scarily able to see almost an incredibly perfect response to a question on how to create this document. Well, we are going to, and we are already starting to see as our model with Imperial College London has tested to ways to actually create highly predictive, personalized models that can give you a feedback loop to know how you're doing and what you should do based on your data. And synthetic data will be game-changing and an enabler to that because right now a lot of data is siloed. And whilst we're creating open data frameworks, federated frameworks, this really leapfrogs a lot of that as long as you have sufficient interconnected pattern capabilities in the data. We've done that with just 300,000 plus user data points against those attributes and biomarkers, but that creates you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of combinatorial patterns. And that's where we can start to train the data and just make it more and more predictive over time. That is so exciting. So I know we're running low on time. So two quick questions, most impactful book that you would suggest anyone they have to read. In the field of longevity, I think the one that's doing the rounds right now is Outlive from Peter Attia. I would combine that with Matthew Hyman's book as well. I can't remember what the name of his book is actually, but it's essentially looking at the nutritional impact of living longer. And I think that those two combined really provide a good summary. Tim Spector's work is really worth looking at as well on the nutritional side. I think actually my answer to that question would be, you shouldn't just read one book because 
what happens is you become a little bit taken in by one person's ideology or philosophy and you treat it as gospel. Having read plenty of books in the field, what I start to see in the pattern recognition is that one is really good at cardiovascular health. One is really good at nutritional science. One's really good at emotional health and neuroscience. I would say maybe have a grain of salt in terms of like taking everything you read as being backed, recognizing that there's a lot of conjecture and opinion data kind of thrown in. So really look at the sources of data, anything that's based on outcomes based data that's repeated in constantly through trials, I think is very good data to follow. But remember, we're all different. And so what recipe is good for you is not necessarily the same for me. So the number one recommendation is actually to monitor yourself. Well, I love that suggestion. And then if you have to issue two pieces of advice for people to live a healthier, longer life, the first piece of advice is to download the Humanity app and use that. But what would the second piece of advice be? Well, I kind of already let the cat out the bag on that. It's to monitor yourself. But I think the second thing is actually consistency in the most basic fundamental things that are free wins the race. So forget the supplements, forget the special olive oils, just move more, sleep well, don't eat too much, limit your stress and look after your emotional health and well-being. But just do that every single day. Go for the walk in the park every day. Make sure you do something that gets your heart rate up every day. And the compound interest effect of that is 20 plus years of health. Well, Peter, I appreciate you coming on Next Big Thing HQ. Real quick, before you go, where can the viewers, the listeners find you online? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn. Yeah. And so they can, if they want to follow me, it's linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash Peter Ward Wayne. Of course, I'm on Instagram at Peter Vard. And you've got at Humanity Inc. if you want to follow us as well on Humanity app. So just t- type those in. You can also download the app on the app store. Just search for Humanity. And we're also on Humanity.health if you're just typing us in on uh, a web browser. Well, Peter, I appreciate you joining us. And everyone go check out Humanity on WeFunder. And as always, thank you for tuning in and watching. So long. Thanks Bye-bye. so much, Conan. All the best, everyone.